Let us pray. Gracious, loving, and infinite God, we thank you for each other, for our families, for the truth revealed to us in Scripture, and for your daily presence in our lives. Renew our minds and bodies, and grant us peace within. Open our eyes to your glory in the lives of every living thing, that everywhere and at all times, we assuredly will be mindful of you. Thank you for the music that you have composed in our spirits, sounded in our hearts, to echo your image in us. Awaken us, Lord, to the task of becoming beautiful in spirit, mind, and heart, so that our inner world will reflect your will to the outer world. Make clear our vision that we may see you in all we meet, all we do, all we are, all we can become, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today we celebrate the gifts of the message of God that God shares with and through women. We give thanks for women who have used the gifts that God has given them to transform the church and the world. And we celebrate the ways women continue to keep God's word alive. But as we celebrate the gifts of women, we also lift up the gifts of men because we recognize that in a well-balanced world, each brings out the gifts of the other. God created male and female in the image of God, and it takes both men and women to represent the true image of God. In Exodus, Amran and Jochebed, the parents of a baby boy, took a great risk. The Hebrew population had increased greatly, and Pharaoh grew fearful that the Hebrews could align themselves with one of Egypt's enemies and unseat the Pharaoh's power and government. In response to this fear, Pharaoh sent word that all baby boys were to be thrown into the Nile River and allowed to drown. Shortly after the decree was announced, a baby boy was born to a couple from the tribe of Levi. Amran and Jochebed hid their son for three months, but realizing they could not continue to do so, the mother placed the child in a carefully crafted basket, and she set him adrift in the Nile where the Pharaoh's daughter bathed. When the princess found the infant, she recognized him as belonging to the Hebrews, and the baby's older sister, Miriam, approached the princess and asked, would you like me to find a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby? And when she was given permission to do so, Miriam brought her mother to nurse him and raise him. So for a time, the child was back in the arms of his mother. It is believed that Moses lived with his birth family until he was somewhere between 9 or 12 years old. So his formative years were spent learning about the history of his family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. When the child was old enough, his mother brought him to the princess, who adopted him as her own. Because she drew him out of the waters of the Nile, the princess named him Moses, which means to draw out or deliverer. And so it was the gifts of three women, his mother, his sister Miriam, and the Pharaoh's daughter, who saved him for the divine purpose of his life, to enable God to use the life of Moses as God intended. I imagine that Miriam was there to say goodbye the day that Moses was to leave for the palace. She had watched him float away when he was a baby, and she continued to observe him from a distance in adulthood as he became the adopted prince of Egypt. Miriam lived long enough to witness one of his finest contributions to human history, the greatest human liberation of all time, delivering a people from bondage to freedom with divine help, the blueprint for all subsequent human liberation movements. Miriam saw her younger brother with God, working together. She, she saw him live into God's plan for his life. 
When Moses was but a child, his mother didn't know what God intended, but she knew at his birth that God intended him for greatness. Even Miriam knew during the early years that God had saved Moses for a purpose. Perhaps it was God's gratitude to her that 80 years later, she lived long enough to see him introduce the world to Exodus, the way God moves all people from bondage to liberation. And so it is that two songs, two great songs came together, the song of Moses and the song of Miriam. Moses praising God for the political power that accomplished the Exodus, and Miriam thanking God for the providence that had unfolded across the years. She worshiped the Lord with heartfelt emotion. Her song, as brief and simple as it is, centers on the Lord being highly exalted. Miriam is recognized by all the women as a leader as she leads them in praise. And through her, God revealed messages for his people. She is the first woman in the Bible to be given that privilege of receiving and relating a word from the Lord. There are only three other women in the Hebrew scriptures that the Lord used in this way, Deborah, Huldah, and the wife of Isaiah. I wonder why Moses knew that his sister's testimony was indeed a song. Could it be that across the span of years she sang to him, and the melodies that she sang and the melodies with which she gifted him as a child, he heard again in the midst of all the commotion of the Exodus? It makes perfect sense that Miriam would have been singing to God ever since the Pharaoh's daughter rescued her brother, and throughout the years she watched him grow up, so that when Moses heard the tambourines and dancing, when he heard the melodies unfold, he recognized it as the melodies she had been singing for him as far back as he could remember. The gifts of women include the melody that awakens dance, the harmony by which the soul rejoices. What are the melodies that have come to you as gifts of women have helped you celebrate the gifts of life across the span of years? Songs your mother sang that blessed and comforted you, songs that became themes of adolescence that gifted you through the teen years, Melodies that inspired harmonies that led to experience of cooperation. Themes that will always bless across the years. Could it be that the songs a mother or a sister or aunt sings to a child are really being sung to God because of the profound impact they have on the purpose of a child's life? In The Sound of Music, it was Maria von Trapp and the gifts of a woman into the regimented world of Baron von Trapp that restored meaning and value to family life and altered the course of their future. The world has been singing her melodies ever since, and though she died in February of this year, the melodies of her life will live on. Is there a song in your life, one that inspires you in dark days and comforts you in the lonely ones? a melody that life cannot repress and that grows more treasured as you age? Could it be that God is inspiring a melody to help you on your way? The 96th Psalm calls us to sing a new song. Singing has a way of touching the deepest part of us, a way of shaping our spirit as nothing else can. Singing a song Singing a new song draws us into communities of memory and hope because we are rooted in the promises and saving acts of God. New songs help us remember who we are and to whom we belong. But how can we sing the Lord's song, let alone the Lord's new song, in a world where the natural order comes up with deadly storms one day and the crisis in the Ukraine the next? How can we sing a new song when the world seems to be in a downward spiral of violence and power struggle? How can we sing in a world where there is hunger and cancer? The song of Miriam gives us the right starting place. A victory has been won. One of my seminary professors used to say, 
that as Christians, we are called to live as Easter people in a Good Friday world. The cross is the sign that God thought this world was worth dying for, and Easter morning serves as our guiding light. As we take up our Lenten journey, which leads to the way of the cross, in this season and in our daily lives, we are awed by what God in Christ has done. Something happened in the dying and the rising of Jesus the Messiah, through which the world has become a different place. Jesus sets us free from this way of being in the world for ourselves. It was never part of God's created order for us to become like the darkness that sometimes surrounds us. We would do well to sing. Miriam led Israel in that song by the far shore of the Red Sea. David sang and danced his way into Jerusalem as her king. The people of Israel sang on their way home from the exile in Babylon and still sing as part of their pilgrimage to Jerusalem today. Our lives are an endless song as we celebrate the joy and freedom of life in Christ. And we pray that with the dawn of Easter will come new hope and light so that we may live as people who have heard the prophetic word from the Son of God. In the tradition of the Jews, there is another Exodus movement, perhaps not so well known, but every bit is profound. And it was in the way in which the music of a people enabled their liberation from the gas chambers of Auschwitz. It was well documented that prisoners in concentration camps who were musicians would be called upon to perform concerts and symphonies for their captors. For the musicians, at a time of constant peril, performing their music offered a consuming distraction. Through making music, they were kept alive. On one appointed night, a group of musicians played the performance of their lives, for it had been prearranged that as they played their joyous strains of music for their Nazi guards, several of their fellow prisoners would escape. Everything had been planned to the second. Each musician knew this would be their last symphony, and they played with all their heart. The music made all the sweeter from knowing that their friends and loved ones would have a chance at new life. Music is an exchange between souls, and the most triumphant music has come from the deepest ebbs of sorrow. And the greatest hymns of faith have come from the darkest of times. Faith causes music in the heart. Miriam's song is a song of faith, and knowing what I know from the song of Miriam, it would not surprise me at all if the musicians of Auschwitz were in fact recreating in their darkest hours of human history the melodies of life once gifted to them in their childhood, the music of the heart. Think of what each of us can do for others when we live out the music of the heart. Dear friends, as we grow in the knowledge of Jesus, as we come to mo know more and more deeply God's love for us, through Jesus' life and ministry, and as we experience the truth of the crucifixion and the power of the resurrection, not only as something that happens at the end of this life, but over and over and over within this life, then we worship Christ as the one for whom we have been waiting, and we too sing a new song. Amen.